Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in just a minute, but before we do, uh, a few housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording the event and we'll have the video available in about a week um, in case you'd like to rewatch it or share with anybody else who might be interested. Um, you can access this video and all the videos from this season and prior seasons on the Basic Science website. Uh, we'll post that URL in the chat for you. Uh, we are expecting a good number of guests, so to mi minimize background noise, we're going to keep the audience muted, but we would like to hear from you. So if you have questions or comments for any of our speakers, um, please post them in the chat. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can throughout the, uh, throughout the hour. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the Interim Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, Richard Allen. Great. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome back. Hopefully, welcome back to uh, the basic science lights the way. Um, as Susan said, I'm Richard Allen. I'm the interim dean of mathematical and physical sciences, and I'm really delighted to be here taking part in another event uh, with one of my fellow deans, with Mike Botchen. Um, so this is our third event of the season, um, and you know it's really exciting for me just to see the breadth. Um, and the relevance of the science stories that we're able to, to present, put in front of you, from research about fires and drought in the first um, event to earthquakes, one of my favorite topics, for the, of course, for those of you who were with us last time, um, and geomicrobiology. So, so these are, sorry, I'm, earthquakes, sorry, that's tonight's topics are going to be now about the physics of 2D materials, genomic engineering, and geomicrobiology. Um, these may seem unrelated, but the organizing principle for today's topics is our graduate students. Our graduate students, of course, are absolutely central to everything that we do. Um, in addition to the fascinating research that each of, of these students conduct, we want to um, highlight the incredibly important role that the graduate students play. We often call them the glue that holds the entire enterprise together. And I can tell you as a faculty member that when we want to start working on new interdisciplinary efforts, we often look for that perfect graduate student who can bridge the two disciplines. That's how key our graduate students are. Um, so because they both participate in the research and they teach and mentor our undergraduates, they're key. Without them, Berkeley would be a very different place. There would be no paradigm shifting discoveries and no teaching of the next generation of scientists. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to Mike Botchen, the Dean of Biological Sciences and a former Berkeley graduate student himself. He's going to interview our students this evening. So Mike is a professor of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology at Berkeley. He received his PhD from Berkeley in 1972 and was recruited back here in 1980 to become an associate professor in molecular biology. His scholarly work at UC has included contributions to virology, to the unraveling of the mechanisms of DNA replication, and he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is a fellow of the American Society for Microbiology. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Well, thank you, Richard. I'm particularly excited about this evening's event because graduate students inspire me. And as Richard said, they play a key role in everything we do at Berkeley. Their research pushes boundaries, and you'll get to see some of that this evening and they are crucial to teaching our undergraduates. Now, uh, because I was a graduate student here, uh, I was given the opportunity to moderate this uh, panel and I actually asked to do so. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about my own, uh, just one little vignette about my own career here at Berkeley and how it got started. So graduate students choose mentors generally, not the other way around. And for many reasons become part of a very special community defined by uh, the faculty, the community that the faculty provide, uh, connecting students to the current, latest and greatest in the past. Uh, my own experience in choosing this goes, in choosing uh, a graduate mentor goes back to 1968, uh, uh, before uh, many, of, uh, many of you may have been born. Uh, and let me just tell you that uh, I had done lots of independent research in high school and college, 
but there was still an imposter feeling inside when it came to use of the word independent. So when I came to Berkeley in 68, I searched for a professor who would help me become truly independent. And that's when I found John Hurst, the chemistry assistant professor in Hildebrand Hall. Berkeley then as now was loaded with faculty who had different styles. And when I spoke to John in my first year, uh, uh, he didn't sell me. He basically said I could do whatever I wanted to do, especially if it had anything to do with DNA or chromosomes. Uh, John got tenure in his second year, and he took a sabbatical leave at Caltech, where I often visited with him uh, for stays when he introduced me as a colleague and not, not his graduate student to some of the Caltech faculty who were his professors and mentor. See, he took his sabbatical at the place where he was a, a graduate student. Uh, now, uh, he introduced me one day to Linus Pauling, who is for me like Zeus on Mount Olympus. And uh, of course, Pauling had already won two Nobel prizes, but Pauling had brought physical chemistry and structure to biology. Uh, and I was tr truly thrilled when Pauling asked me at lunch what I was studying and then started to probe me uh, for what did I learn so far? And I was, a little, uh, I was a little intimidated, but he really wanted to know. And it touched me deeply that uh, he was interested in what I was doing. And I saw my own uh, 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 cultural lineage connected from him to me. And such positive experiences were amplified throughout my graduate career in many different ways. Playing flag football with George Pimentel, who actually broke one of my ribs uh, in, in practice and discussing backpacking with Joel Hildebrand, who was still around coming in and talking to graduate students. And uh, this, 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 these kinds of experiences, I hope uh, we'll get an opportunity to, to hear some of our students, some of our rising stars today, uh, tell us a little bit about their own experiences, not only in research, but, their, but with their faculty. So with that, I'll now ask our speakers, Emma, Arik, and Susan, to tell us about their research in general and current projects specifically. I encourage our audience to put questions into the chat about these presentations. Okay, so our first speaker is Emma Regan. Emma Regan is an Applied Science and Technology PhD candidate uh, studying under Professor Feng Wang. Emma completed her bachelor's degree in physics at Wellesley College in 2016, and then joined UC Berkeley's Applied Science and Technology Graduate Group as a National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellow. Her research focuses on the intersection of material science, optics, and condensed matter. Emma, uh, the floor is now yours, and tell us about your research uh, on physics of 2D materials. All right, fantastic. Let me share my screen with you all. Can you see that okay? Yes. All right, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's really, really wonderful to be here today. Um, I'm a PhD student in Professor Feng Wang's lab in the physics department. Um, and as a team, we study interesting physics that emerges in two-dimensional materials. So today I wanna to introduce you to these materials and share a fascinating new direction that I've been thinking about during my PhD. All right, so let's start with two materials, diamond and graphite. They're both made entirely of carbon, but diamond is super strong and graphite is so soft that it flakes off on your paper when you use it in a pencil. So how can we explain this? Well, the answer lies in their crystal structure. Diamond has strong bonds between the carbon atoms in all three directions, whereas graphite has strong bonds between the carbon atoms within a plane, but very weak bonds connecting the layers. So graphite is unlike a typical material. Because of these weak bonds between the layers, it's actually possible to peel off just one layer of graphite, which we call graphene. And graphene is a two-dimensional material, meaning it's only one atom thick. So it turns out that graphene is actually very different from graphite. Graphite is a metal. It's otherwise not so interesting. On the other hand, graphene has some remarkable properties. It conducts heat and electricity extremely well. In fact, electrons can move at 1% of the speed of light inside graphene. So you might wonder, how do you get just one atomic layer of graphite? Well, it turns out that you use tape uh, to thin the crystal down. So scotch tape actually works really, really well for this purpose. And the first researchers to isolate graphene did it in this way, which is amazingly how they won the Nobel Prize. 
So since the discovery of graphene in 2004, a whole family of 2D materials has been discovered with a huge range of properties. So this goes from electrically insulating materials like hexagonal boron nitride, which has the same crystal structure as graphene, but will just replace the carbon atoms with alternating boron and nitrogen, and also semiconductors like the family of transition metal dichocogenides. Now, one of the most interesting and exciting things about 2D materials is that we can take a bunch of different materials and then stack them together into what we call heterostructures. We can pick exactly which layers to stack together, in what order, and also at what angle, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. Now, the electrons in each layer are super sensitive to what's happening around them, so you can start to imagine how we might combine these to form new materials with properties that aren't found in nature. But I wanna dig deeper into something I said in the previous slide. So I said that there are insulators and semiconductors and metals, um, but do all materials fit into these categories? Are they all this simple? And the answer is no, not all materials behave so simply. Um, we can classify materials in this way with one important assumption, which is that the electrons do not interact very strongly with each other. So instead of this complex situation where we have here, we have all these atoms and electrons in the solid, we can really just consider this. We have an electron that's moving through a periodic arrangement of atoms, ignoring the other free electrons, something like this. And in this case, yeah, we have insulators and semiconductors and metals. So this is actually a really good assumption for many materials because the electrons move around really quickly and they hardly notice each other. So we can sort of understand this intuitively by thinking of an analogy. If you're on a walk and you see a friend, as you walk past each other, you have time to say hi, ask how you're doing. In other words, you can interact pretty strongly. But if you are driving in a car at 30 miles an hour and you notice your friend driving towards you in another car, you'll be lucky if you have the chance to, pass, to wave before you pass each other. So here, going slower means that you interact more strongly. Going faster means weaker interactions. This is the same for electrons and materials. If they're zooming around, they can't really interact strongly. And the behavior of the material is pretty easily described by independent electrons. But what happens if these interactions between electrons do matter? Well, these interactions lead to a whole zoo of different types of matter, uh, which is part of a family that we call quantum materials, since we really need to consider quantum mechanical effects to describe their behavior. So you've probably heard about some quantum materials before. Uh, superconductors, for example, these are materials that flow current with zero resistance, they fall into this family, um, as do magnets. And it turns out that there's actually a whole family of these quantum materials with strange emergent properties. So now we can turn to the fundamental question that I've been thinking about during my PhD, which is how can we turn a boring old material into a quantum material? In other words, how can we encourage these electron-electron interactions to dominate the properties of a material? And to answer this question, I wanna look back at the 2D material that I introduced a few minutes ago. All right, so let's consider two layers of 2D materials shown here. Doesn't really matter which ones. And let's say we stack them on top of each other. We can do this in the lab. Now we'll twist one, with respect to the other. And as you can see, as we twist this, a periodic pattern emerges that changes with the twist angle. When the angle is small, the size of the pattern grows larger. We call this a Mori super lattice. So it turns out that a Mori super lattice is exactly what we want to control whether or not the interactions between electrons matter. So to start here, at different positions in the super lattice, the atoms line up differently. So at this point, you'll notice that the lattices are stacked exactly on top of each other. And then if we go a little bit further away, we're sort of out of sync, and then they come back and they line up together again sometime later. So let's think about what happens to electrons in this type of super lattice. Well, electrons will have certain energies depending on the, the atoms around them. So if we consider two different electrons at different positions, they'll have different energies based on the atoms that are around them. Now, electrons always want to be at the position of lowest energy. So if the electron's energy is lowest at this position, say, where the stacking is right on top of each other, then this electron would rather live over here. So this is similar to a situation kind of like this, where we have some soccer ball sitting on rolling hills. Because of the gravity, the soccer ball is naturally going to sit in the valley, not at the peak here. And it's going to roll down the hill to a position with lower energy. So in this case, the height variation of the landscape, much like our stacking variation in the super lattice, is going to force the balls to be stuck in these valleys. And importantly, these hills then reduce the speeds of the soccer ball because they've kind of got to roll back to that energy minimum. So coming back to our super lattice, we can start to think about how a super lattice would allow us to slow electrons down and increase the effect of electron-electron interactions. So now we can put all these ideas together in the lab. We can stack any 2D material on top of any other with control over the twist angle. 
And this is going to allow us to turn a not so interesting material into a completely new material with emergent quantum properties. All right, so this is what my days look like in the lab. Uh, we look for evidence of these interesting quantum behaviors in super lattices using lasers. So this is a picture of me and my wonderful lab mate, Dan Cheng, standing next to a laser that we use most days. Um, and in the past couple of years, we've been able to demonstrate all sorts of interesting non-classical behavior in these super lattices. So let me dive into one result quickly to give you a sense of what we can see here. All right, so again, let's consider what happens when we add electrons to a Mori super lattice. If we have a few electrons in the system, they're all sitting at their low energy positions in the Mori super lattice, but there's plenty of empty space around for them to sort of hop around between different sites. And in general, the material's resistance will be low. But when we add just enough electrons so that there's one electron in every single energy minimum, as we can see here, things change. Since the interactions between the electrons is strong and repulsive, right, to like charges repel, then the electrons prefer to stay on their own site because it costs energy to be close to any of the other electrons. So therefore, when we have exactly the right number of electrons in the system, we can expect the material to suddenly become insulated. The electrons can't move anymore. And this is what we call a Mott insulator. So in my work, I developed a new optical technique to look for evidence of this Mott insulating state, and we saw it. We, but we actually weren't too surprised since this type of state has been seen in other materials. But we were very surprised to find additional states at lower electron densities. So in this case, we were able to make the electron-electron interaction so important that electrons were avoiding sitting next to neighboring electrons as well, because these, these uh, interactions were so strong. And that leads them to form these beautiful patterns of electrons. Similar states have been predicted decades ago, but they've never actually been seen before. And more recently, we figured out how to actually see these states using a technique called scanning tunneling microscopy. So each blue dot that you see here is actually an electron sitting in these beautiful geometric patterns. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with that image um, and say thank you very much for your attention today. Well, thanks, Emma. That was really spectacular. Uh, I, I have a few questions uh, for you, and I hope that the audience uh, eventually gets to ask questions uh, for you if they have them. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in whether these 2D heterostructures will have applications for the future that may be either of commercial value or of value for making new discoveries about matter. Uh, could you make a comment on that, on, on how you imagine uh, them playing a role in e either commercializing uh, applications for, for the public or uh, for other physicists doing, making new discoveries. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, it's great that you actually bring up these two different spaces for applications, because I think there are, there are important applications in both. Um, so sort of on the first side for commercial applications, um, these materials are stable. They interact really strongly with light. Um, they are potentially integratable with, with other materials like silicon that we use more, you know, more often commercially. Um, and so there's a huge wealth mm -hmm. of um, potential applications sort of on the device side and the sort of user side. On the physics side, I would say, um, this is the side that I'm sort of more excited about right now, um, but there's, there's a huge wealth of opportunity here because what we're essentially able to do in these Mori super lattices is simulate different types of matter. So just by changing you know, the twist angle, the materials we want to incorporate into these super lattices, um, we can change the type of interactions, how strong they are, how weak they are relative to other interactions in the system. And we can really start sort of simulating and creating new matter um, in ways that will allow us to you know, both produce new interesting results, but also test our understanding of physics um, and make sure that you know, our theories are really matching up with, with what yeah. is possible in the world. Ex exciting. I have one last question. Uh, so this goes back to my introductory comments. Do you have any comments to make about uh, your interactions with your own professor uh, or, uh, or other faculty that, that have been particularly important to you? Yeah, I mean, I'll say I have an absolutely wonderful relationship with my advisor, uh, Professor Fang Wang here. And something that's been really special about my experience here is that um, we sort of have a what I like to call a grandpa PI here as well, because um, Professor Ron Shen, who was uh, my advisor's postdoc advisor, is actually still in uh, in the building as well and comes to our group meetings um, and you know has this huge yeah. amount of experience and insight to share with us all. Um, and I think it's 
it's been such a treat to have sort of mentorship at these different levels of uh, you know, experience and uh, not just, you know, experience in the lab, but experience in life and in yeah. academia and in research. So it's that lineage that you're feeling. Yeah, that I yes, refer to. absolutely. Yeah, are terrific. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have to go on now to Ar Arik Shams. Uh, he, he's a PhD candidate in molecular cell biology doing research in Professor David Savage's lab. Arik uh, received his bachelor's from the University of Southern Mississippi, after which he did a post back study at the National Institutes of Health, where he got interested in protein biochemistry. After coming to Berkeley, he became fascinated with gene, gene editing tools and how to manipulate them to better suit our needs. Aside from science, Arik is also interested in science policy and how that will come to bear in the age of gene editing. Arik, Tell us about your research on protein engineering, genome editing, and synthetic biology. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining in, and thanks, Mike, for the introduction. To share my screen. Um, wait, so um, I'm a PhD candidate in molecular and cell biology in Dave Savage's lab. And uh, as Mike mentioned, I consider myself in broad strokes uh, protein engineer or synthetic biologist. And what that means is I look at biology that exists in nature and think of ways to um, improve them and make them better and uh, change how they work so that we can um, use them better. And so the title of my main official title of my project is here as shown, but I'm going to simplify it really down to its essence, which is um, can we make existing gene editing tools smaller? That's really what it boils down to. And uh, uh, gene editing tool that I'm talking about is something that you're all probably familiar with, um, CRISPR-Cas9. And just as a brief primer, the way it works is it's uh, Cas9 is a molecular machine that can um, find, bind to, and cut very specific um, sequences of DNA. And this has completely revolutionized our ability to um, edit genes both for therapeutic and research purposes. And to the point where um, this technology has earned uh, Jennifer Doudna and Manuel Charpentier the Nobel Prize last year. So it's really thrilling to be in this field. And, uh, you know, Cas9 is great, um, but one of the things um, that I want to talk, so here I'm showing a cartoon representation of this molecule. Um, and, you know, it's great, but it can be better, is how I look at it. And one of the reasons it can be better is it's a very large molecule. It's made up of many different pieces, which are color coded here and labeled. And sometimes it's, in some cases, it's so big that it may, it's difficult to deliver inside cells for therapeutic applications or any other kind of application. And so the question that um, I was interested in is can we shrink Cas9 to make it easier to package for delivery? And also by doing so, can we learn more about this molecule um, by seeing which pieces are essential? Okay, so we developed this technique in the lab called MISER, and the acronym is a minimization by iterative size exclusion recombination. But very simply, what we do is we take the DNA that um, Cas is encodes Cas9, and we cut it up in randomly into many small pieces, and then we put them back together randomly or recombine into much smaller fragments. And then we take these fragments and we test them for the same function as Cas9. And one analogy that I like to think about is if you imagine a, a recipe, here is a simple one for apple crisp. And you know, what if we randomly just removed a bunch of these words and letters from these instructions? Well, it turns out you can still you know, basically follow the recipe and still end up with a decent dessert. You know, it might not be as good as apple crisp, but it's still good enough and you know, probably tastes like apple. And so that's essentially what we're doing with this technique is we're cutting up the DNA into a lot of pieces and putting them back together. And the fragments that are left have a lot of pieces missing, but we're trying to find the ones that still work. And um, I will show you one piece of data because I think it's really pretty and it might look very technical, but I just wanna focus um, on just a small part. So these are all these pixels here that are all um, kind of represented in this pyramid, each represent a single variant. 
that we tested and we tested around 10 million variants for function, um, whether they work as Cas9 uh, is supposed to. And you see these red zones here um, at the bottom, those represent large sections of Cas9 that can be removed, but still um, work. So this was uh, very exciting because it's included some rather large pieces of the protein that we thought were previously very important, but turns out you can delete them and that's okay. Um, and so uh, out to uh, my co-author, Sean Higgins, who was a Berkeley PhD student as well. And um, so I looked at this figure that Sean made and I asked, well, you know, it's great that these single large pieces can be removed, but what if I want to make it even smaller? So what I did was I took those single deletions, um, which I which are on this cartoon near the top, and I've just masked out the pieces that we know can be deleted. Um, and then I asked, well, what if I combine these deletions to try to make this protein even smaller? And so I did just that. Um, here's one version where I combined three deletions. And um, when I say combine three deletions, what I mean is I actually took out three big pieces. And then on top of that, I took out an even uh, like one more piece. So we have this minimal version is what we call it that has quadruple deletion. So four big deletions and compared to the original, it's much smaller in size. It's 66% of the original to be exact. Um, and this is just a cartoon representation of what I imagine it looks, looks like because I've just kind of like removed them from the picture. But um, now I wanna show you, I was, I was interested um, basically, you know, I'm imagining that this is what it looks like, this minimized version, but what does it really look like? And so um, we performed this technique called cryo electron microscopy, where we were able to look at the protein directly. And I'm showing you again, the complete Cas9 here on the left and in the middle, our cartoon representation. And then finally, this is the actual picture we took of a Cas9 molecule. And the red mesh overlay here represents the whole molecule and the gray volume is our minimized version of Cas9. And you can see it actually occupies almost the exact same volume as expected. Um, you know, this part right here is the DNA and the RNA and then the rest of it occupies the same protein, uh, same volume. And so here's another view and I've color coded this minimized version according to the original. And you can see it's like, it's amazing that the re remaining pieces um, still occupy the same shape. So this was really exciting for us to kind of learn, you know, even this smaller version works and it looks almost exactly the same. Okay, so what does this mean for the field? So smaller Cas9 um, could make it easier to deliver genomic therapies and also enable us to deliver uh, other kinds of cargo to the to the cell inside the nucleus to the to the genome. Um, it also offers us a lot of new knowledge because by doing this screen by systematically removing pieces, we now sort of have a better idea of what the essential pieces are of this protein. Um, and that actually informs us a lot about the evolution of this protein because what I've shown you is, a single Cas9 from a single species of bacteria, but there are hundreds, thousands, maybe millions more of these molecules out there that are all different. And by learning more about how one works, we can sort of learn a lot more about how these others came to be and how we can exploit them better. Um, and so with that, I'll just uh, end by thanking my co-author. So this was a very collaborative project and I couldn't have done uh, any of this without the help of um, all the people uh, listed here, and then my lab, uh, the Savage Lab, including Dave, my PI, um, who's a great mentor, and uh, funding sources, and also thanks to the Basic Science uh, Lights Away team. Well, thanks, Arik. Uh, wow, uh, millions of different proteins that you analyzed. Uh, amazing. Uh, can, can you elaborate a little bit more on why engineering uh, smaller proteins will be important uh, for applications? Uh, again, either uh, ones that will uh, be of commercial value or for basic science. Uh, I, I think it, there's, there's room for a little bit more exploration there, or explicit comments. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, like I said, um, a lot of delivery methods for therapies have a hard limit on size. So it is, uh, I think it's a very valuable 
place to essentially try to see if we can make proteins smaller while still retaining their function. So that's definitely one um, like therapeutic application. Um, we actually have a few other stuff in the uh, pipeline to use these proteins. So one important one is to use it as a platform for delivering other molecules to the genome. So in particular, um, base editors is a, is a, base editing is a pretty new technology that kind of exploits um, the targeting ability of Cas9. And by using smaller um, Cas9s that still work, you're able to um, I guess, like fuse like other molecules to this platform, to this protein to see like to carry it over inside cells. Um, in fact, uh, we have some projects in the lab right now that are replacing some of the domains that we could remove in this project with base editing domains. So like completely like pieces from completely different proteins that will then do the work of that protein um, instead of the instead of like the, the space that the um, other pieces of the protein are taking up. Um, so there's tons of I mean, you know, and you could apply this technique to any protein theoretically. So there's lots of, you know, directions to go with this, I think. Yeah. Well, we have a, we have a question from the audience. Uh, this is from Maria. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the policy work you're interested in doing around gene editing, maybe? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so I, uh, this was actually a recent um, kind of idea from, or like revelation for me is that I, um, really think like gene editing research and development has to go hand in hand with figuring out the, or like hand in hand with policy. Um, and one of the main reasons for it is that, you know, this technology is accelerating and progressing extremely fast. And I think uh, there's a ton of work to be done in both um, making sure this technology is equitable, um, used for the right reasons, used by the right people, um, and uh, not, uh, you know, not controlled by like just a few people who are able to do it and like in, in uh, first world countries, for example. So um, I think there's, this technology is completely revolutionary and um, it needs to be a bit more, uh, or it needs to be as public facing as possible. So that's actually a field that I'm, I'm hoping to get into after my PhD. Um, just to, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of flavor. Like I think, I think, you know, this technology is incredible and amazing, but it needs uh, to be guided, I guess, in a way. Yeah, the <laughs> ethical aspects of, of, of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, now uh, we have, a, we have a, a question from the audience, another one, and I think it's Warren Gish, who is a former student of mine, but I'm not sure. Uh, 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 please repeat uh, that new technology that you, you, you were talking about. It sounded like base something. I think what you were referring yeah. to was, was base editing. Do you want to explain yes. that to Warren? Sure, yeah. So base editing is a, is a relatively newer technology that came out, um, uh, you know, basically like in the, in the heels of Cas9. So um, Cas9 can um, target uh, itself to specific sequences of DNA, and then it cuts that like target in the DNA. And then uh, the cellular repair mechanism can fix the cut or um, insert something else. So that's how Cas9 works. Base editing is actually far more precise. So what this does is actually um, uh, this tool can go to the same targets as Cas9 and alter the individual bases of the DNA. So A, T, G, C, the four bases that make up DNA, um, this tool can convert A's to T's or C's to G's. And by doing so, there's no cutting involved. It's a, it's a lot more precise. And um, you know, this is just some uh, like really cool technology that can really like expands the toolkit, I guess. Um, so if you it's, more, it, cutting, it's more like a word, uh, a, a letter spell check. Then, Absolutely. Uh, I was about to say, yeah. you know, if you imagine like cutting and pasting, this is sort of like, it's like down to the letter, you're just kind of like changing the letter directly instead of erasing the whole word and retyping it or something like that. Yeah. Now, I, uh, I just want to uh, remind the audience that uh, uh, you, you can go back and ask questions to Emma in the chat and we, we're, we're doing just fine on time. And uh, any questions that you might have for Emma. 
uh, I'll be I'll be happy at the end to uh, make sure that she gets them and, and answers them. Uh, I, I have one last question for Arik, if we can deal with it in a minute or two, and that's I, I of course, uh, am a managing director of the IGI, and I know a lot about what's going on there. But you want to comment a little bit about what it's like to be working in the IGI building now with so many people focused on gene editing and your relationships with, with David Savage, perhaps, or even Jennifer? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I'll start with saying that, uh, you know, I... Um, Dave, my mentor, has been fantastic. He's been um, extremely helpful and on an individual level, but also one of the uh, privileges of working with Dave is that um, I've been able to network a tremendous amount with people in this building in IGI. Um, and we collaborate heavily with, with uh, Jennifer Doudna's lab. Um, so, you know, like they provide a ton of like information and resources and advice on, on these, um, on, CRISPR systems and then we sort of like use our expertise to manipulate them and engineer them and do cool stuff so it's it's been a great relationship um, and then just working in this building has been just really exciting and I will say like even even my interest in policy has has a has kind of um, come about because of my interactions with people in this building who all sort of think about gene editing holistically and not just about you know just the day-to-day -day stuff um so it's been it's been a really fantastic environment um and yeah i i mean what else is okay. there to say it's been great <laughs> thank you arik okay so we're moving on to susan mullen uh she's a phd candidate advised by jill bainfield in the department of earth and planetary science Though she spent most of her undergraduate career studying lung and pancreatic cancer, she fell in love with environmental science when she did a summer internship studying the effects of pollution on giant honeybees in India and the summer in, 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 in India uh, during the summer of 2017. She decided that the best way to combine her love of cellular biology and environmental science would be to study microbial communities across different ecosystems. After graduating from MIT with a bachelor's degree in biology, Susan worked in an oceanographic lab studying microbes living in oxygen minimal zones of the tropical Northeastern Pacific. She then applied to graduate school and was thrilled to have the opportunity to attend Berkeley and work in Jill's lab, where she studies microbes living in a river Riverine ecosystem. Uh, sorry that I stumbled on that word there. Susan can tell you uh, can can tell us about her research uh, on microbial communities in the East River, uh, not the East River here in Brooklyn, but the East River somewhere else. I'm actually in Brooklyn now, folks. Uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Susan, you can now share your screen and uh, uh, tell us about your research. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Mike, and um, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight to tell you more about my research. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. So today I'll be talking about biogeochemical drivers of microbial processes in the hyperreic zone of the East River, or in other words, which microbes are in the East River and what are they doing? Okay, so the East River is located in Crested Butte, Colorado, and it's part of the upper catchment of the Colorado River. Um, in this panel here, we have an elevation map, and the East River is located about 3,500 meters, so it's in a mountainous environment. And because of that, there's a very long winter season where the river is completely covered in snow. And then as the temperatures warm in the spring and summer, um, the snow melts and then it also becomes a drought season um, towards the end of the summer. And in the first title, I introduced this idea of the hyperreic zone. So what is it and why are we interested in it? So if you look at this image here, these pink arrows are indicating where the hyperreic zone is. So it's this region of sediment and forest space where river and groundwater mix. And because it's this mixing of nutrients from river water and groundwater, it is a microbial hotspot for activity. And so I'm particularly interested in how the water chemistry, the river connectivity and hydrology all affect what microbial communities live there and what they're able to do metabolic, metabolically 
and also what they um, are actively doing at the site. And so if we can answer these questions, then we can make, um, we can learn more about what nutrients these microbes are exporting, what trace gas emissions they're exporting, and also um, how climate change will affect these microbial processes. Okay, so now how do we sample this um, hyperreic zone? So what I've done is I go out to Colorado and I bury tubes in um, the river. And so we're trying to get at the sweet spot, which is about 30 centimeters. And so after we've dug all of this stuff, we need to bury the tubes and then um, let them sit for 48 hours so they can equilibrate. And so we're not being too disruptive. And then once they're buried, we um, use a peristaltic pump and we filter about a hundred gallons and then um, into a filter. And with the filter, we have um, all of the cells that are living there and then we can extract the DNA. And so, I wanted to show you the sites that I chose along the East River. So we were looking for depth and breadth. So we have an upstream site called East Above Quigley, more downstream um, East Below Copper, and then the pump house site. And then this is the apparatus that we bring into the field where we house um, the filters. And we use a 0.1 micron filter because the microbial communities are really small. Um, the cells themselves are small. So that's why it's 0.1 microns. Um, and so when we go out, we want to consider what time of year we're going and also what's happening because you have to dig and get at these sites and you can't be too overwhelmed with the water or else you won't be able to dig. So this shows the um, discharge patterns um, of the river. And so you can see that there's this um, effect that you see every year where there are really high points and low points and um, it's cyclical and some years there's more snowfall and then other years there less, there's less snowfall. And so we went out in August of 2020 over here. And so this is when the river is decreasing and discharge at the fallen limb. So it's very accessible and you can still dig um, and get to that sweet spot of the hyperreic zone. And so this is an overview of the analysis that we do and the steps that we take to understand what microbial communities are living there. So in this first panel, this is the set setup that we do with um, the peristaltic pump where we're filtering 100 gallons. And then in here, we have a filter that's 0.1 microns. So that has all of our cells on it. So we go, so we come home back to Berkeley and we take pipe cutters and we cut these open. And then we extract the DNA um, with the DNA extraction kit. And then we send it for sequencing. And so one of the really cool things about um, metagenomics is that you're, looking at what's actively there and you have all of these cells and a whole community is happening and you need to tease apart who's there and what's happening and break it down. So um, we send the DNA for sequencing um, and then we assemble these small fragments of DNA and then we cluster them based on what they have in common. So then we have a sense of what organisms are living there. And then um, we can do all sorts of analyses once we have that information. Okay, and so um, this is an overview of what we got from the summer of 2020. So um, 10 to the 10 base pairs of, of data. So that's a lot. And so um, for reference, the human genome is about 3.2 billion. So this is an order of magnitude greater than that. So we have so much data and then we have to figure out what's actively living there. So I'm gonna show you one of the really cool things that we found um, at the East Above Quigley site uh, that we're really excited about. So, um, when we looked at the data as a whole, you want to look at what you can actively see and you can group together and then also what you can't group together. And so in what we call the unbin portion, um, I found methanoperidins. And so that's really exciting because methanoperidins are anaerobic archaea that are able to metabolize methane. And so that gives us a clue that there must be methane there. And so um, we are going to go back to these sites and, and we actually did this past summer and then we'll do it this next summer and see um, what else is there. So if there's methane and we have these methanoperidins, then that's a pretty good indicator that there are going to be other um, methane metabolizing organisms that can eat the methanoperidins and are also consuming and utilizing the methane. So we're really excited about um, what we're going to find um, in our next steps. So. Like I said, we went back there this past summer and now I have a ton of samples. So I have 28 um, metagenomic samples um, from the hyperreic zone. 
And we also got corresponding RNA samples. So the RNA samples will tell us what they're actively doing um, when we do a transcriptomic analysis. And so um, the great thing is, is that once you have more and more samples, you can really get a clearer image of what organisms are there. So right now what I've showed you is just scratching the surface. And so I'm in the process of analyzing um, what we got from this summer and we're really excited to see um, what more methane metabolism um, is there and what other organisms are there. And so um, thank you guys so much for your attention. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, all of the funding sources for my research and my advisor, Jill, uh, has been really awesome and made it possible for me to do field work during the pandemic. And um, all of the people, it's a very group effort and the people at the National Lab, um, the hydrologists and the people um, in Crested Butte, Colorado who actually helped me um, in the field. Thanks. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, in more depth about whether, uh, why metagenomics uh, as you use that word, is such a good tool for studying microbial communities. Sure. So one of the really cool things about metagenomics is that it allows you to actually look at a whole community of organisms. So prior to metagenomics and even prior, there's a lot of organisms that you can't culture in a mm -hmm. lab and you can't grow and study. So like E. coli, you can always study that in the lab. But these methanoperidins, it would be very difficult to replicate the environment and understand them. So using metagenomics, you get a real snapshot of what's there and also the proportions. And there's, there's nothing really that we, you, can, you don't bias it when you do it. It's very much so real time, what's there and what's happening. So it's, it's really awesome. And also, as I showed, there are lots of base pairs and then we can make sense of um, a really large community and use computational techniques to break down the organisms that are there. So you can actually get hundreds of organisms that you can't grow and it's particularly suited for working in the field, I guess. Yes, and there are yeah. some crazy cool environments that you can study and this is just really exciting, yeah. Yeah, so what are some of the challenges that come from field work and, and how, how, do you, how do you manage them? And, a related question, if you have, if you know, if you want to elaborate on this, have you ever worked with Jill in the, uh, alongside her in the field? Yes. So I'll answer them in order. The field. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this past summer, there were some like our truck broke down. That you have to get to difficult places, and you're carrying a lot of equipment. And so I think the best way you can plan for everything, and you still don't know what could go wrong. So just making sure you budget your time and that you have realistic expectations. Um, and also I had, I have on this page, Jacob and Jordan, they came with me and they were the people who were helping me sample every day because it's just a lot of equipment. So I think you just need to have realistic expectations and plan your time well and know that you'll still be able to get data even if you can't go to all make get all of the samples that you planned in the beginning. Um, and so I have been in the field with Jill. We sampled um, a mine that was in her backyard and it was awesome. She's just, she, she, she like, um, I'm such a fan, but she, it, it was just, she can tell you everything and she can give you really good advice while you're on the spot. And like, if things break it, she just always has a really good attitude about troubleshooting it and making it work. Um, and she's a really great hiker, so she can get to all the crazy sites and we're just trying to keep up with her. So it's just, it's really nice to see her be so active in our, in our research and be a part of things and her passion when we're out there. It's really great. Yeah. yeah thank you, Susan. Uh, these were all very inspiring, uh, talks. Uh, I, I, uh, I'd like to engage you all now in a, in a, in the remaining few minutes that we have in a, a conversation around the general question uh, uh, that I'd like to pose to all of you in order. And that's how have your ideas about the future changed since you got to Berkeley? Uh, you came in with certain expectations. Uh, you wanted to get a PhD uh, and uh, uh, w w how, how have these ideas changed and uh, are, are they the same as uh, uh, what, what came before? 
when you entered? I can answer that first. Yeah, um, Susan. So. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Um, so I guess for me, uh, sort of since fr from before undergrad even, um, I have sort of always been trying to balance uh, the fundamental and the applied. And uh, this sort of fits in well with what, you know, what I chose to do in the sense that a lot of dense matter physics and material science has sort of clear applications and making devices and things that will help people. Um, but I find that really my, my passion is very much in sort of these interesting, tricky new things that we can do in physics and the creativity there. Um, so sort of after, you know, during my PhD at, at Berkeley, um, I've, I've been really lucky to be in, in Fung's group where I think that sort of creativity and, uh, you know, sort of that quick thinking and can we, you know, can we figure out how to do this um, really has been sort of cultivated and, and, you know, grown in that sense. But I still have that sort of lingering, like, okay, but what can we do with this? And, you know, how will this, <laughs> will this matter to anybody? And, you know, what problems can I solve with this? Um, so I think, you know, as I'm thinking about wrapping up my PhD and, and sort of what to do next, I feel extremely grateful to sort of have that physics training and that creativity and that, you know, you know, but what if, could this exist? Could this be possible? Um, but then pushing that towards, okay, but how can we help people with it? So I'm really excited to, I feel very much like there are enormous opportunities for me right now. I'm very excited about it. So you're, you're, you're even more enthusiastic about being a scientist. And, and I think so. I think so. Never. That's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Susan, uh, I have to backtrack for a second because there was actually a question that came in from the audience to you before you answer this uh, question from me. Uh, uh, and that is uh, about uh, uh, methane, uh, generally methane in organisms that produce methane. Is this unusual in rivers? Uh, the questioner has heard a lot about methane in the, I, I guess, in the, in the atmosphere. But what about in rivers? Is there, uh, what ha is this unusual or uh, exciting, new? Uh, it's exciting and new because no one's actually done this before or, or looked at the hyperreic zone um, using metagenomics. And there hasn't been a paper that I'm aware of where they have found um, methane bacteria or, or in archaea. So it is really exciting. Um, and yeah, but it is found in other unique environments that aren't in the atmosphere. So we have found it in, um, there's um, in some soil communities, um, but not in rivers yet. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. So this is a first for water. Yeah, like for rivers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So why don't you, why don't you continue to, uh, you know, uh, this question that I asked about, uh, yeah, uh, uh, what you can how you came here and what's going to happen next. Right. So I definitely came to Berkeley knowing that I loved research and wanted to be doing more of it, but it wasn't clear to me what exactly I would want to do after graduating and an experience here that has kind of given me more guidance is I, one of the people who I work with is a hydrologist at the national lab. And I've gotten to see what her job description is like, and it just seems really like something that would be really cool. She does a lot of, um, she is in charge of a few different um, projects at once, and then also gets to do a lot of mentoring and um, workshops where you get to talk with a lot of scientists. So I, I really have learned about the collaboration and being part of working with her and also being a part of this larger focus it's called the East River SFA, where we all are studying it and the scientists all come together to discuss um, different points. So I think I, I'm really looking forward to doing something that involves um, collaboration and also working on a few projects at once seems really exciting. So this is a postdoc where you, where you might be working here she at LBL? A scientist. Yeah, she's a research scientist, but I think she was a postdoc, but now she's- No, no, you, you're thinking- Oh, I would, that would be, sure. such, that would be such a cool opportunity. Yeah, if that worked out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Harik, how, how, how have you progressed or changed or not? Yeah, I think, uh, I think pretty much 
similar to Susan, I also, you know, came in really loving research and wanting to do research, but without a clear idea of what I wanted to do next. I think over the past few years, what has really crystallized for me is, um, I think what I mentioned before is like this combination of science and policy, I think is uh, something that really interests me. And I think something that can like really, um, uh, you know, is a niche that should be filled by scientists. And I think my research in, in this like gene editing field has been very crucial and sort of like inspiring me to do that, um, which is actually something that I um, didn't do my first year at all. I was very much into like cytoskeleton mm -hmm. cell development mm -hmm. type of research. And then I sort of got you know, a series of circumstances I got into gene editing and then I was like, oh, this is great. And then that evolved into like, oh, okay, you know, gene editing as a like holistically, like, sh you know, what are the, what are the so sociological implications of this and that sort of thing. And um, that's, that's, that's what inspires me now um, as I'm, you know, in my sixth year. So yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting progression from my first year, which was, not only was it not science policy, it was like not even gene editing. Um, so uh, it's been it's, it's it's an interesting journey for sure with lots yeah. of turns. Uh, yeah. Well, you're all rising stars, uh, <laughs> ready for the next step. Hey, I, I have a question. Actually, it came from the audience. But uh, do uh, how, how do you how do you uh, interact with undergrads? Uh, Emma, do you want to do you want to start with that? Just a sure. brief one liner or two. Yeah, um, so I've been a, a GSI for a few semesters now, actually just for fun. I'm funded by a fellowship, but I, I really love teaching and um, have, have done that the past few years just for fun. Um, and then I also have undergrads who work with me in the lab. Um, I've mentored mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. over the years, and that's uh, a true joy in my in my day today. Yeah. Susan? Um, I've G I've also liked Emma. I've been a GSI and I'm GSIing this semester. And I think it's really nice to be, I feel like um, interacting with undergrads makes me feel more a part of the Berkeley community because there are so many um, undergrads here and it's, it's always really, um, they're really great students and they ask a lot of really like higher level questions and it's, it's been great. Yeah, gets you to be a mentor yourself. Arik. Um, yeah, so I, I also GSI for a couple of semesters. Um, I also, though, like mentoring for me has been uh, incredibly enjoyable. I think it's just, uh, uh, it's been great to like kind of really see somebody um, uh, come in with a lot of interest and then, you know, being the person to sort of like teach them stuff that turns out like, you know, you took for granted and like stuff that you <laughs> took you a long yes. time to learn also. Um, but to seeing that sort of <coughs> fresh like determination and passion is, is, is like, you know, one of the best parts, I think, of being a grad student. So it, it inspires you just as hearing you now inspires me <laughs> to keep going. Hey, I, I just want to thank uh, all three of you for a, a, a great show here. Uh, I hope the audience learned a lot. And uh, I, I want to have one little comment. I want to say that my own relationship with graduate students has really been that they've often taught me more than I've taught them. And uh, that's, that's an important. And I'm, uh, you, you'll probably reflect back on your own time and realize how much you've taught your, your graduate advisor. Uh, and it's, this is part of what it's like to keep the tradition of science going. Uh, I, I wanna thank, give a special thanks to our alumni and friends uh, for coming tonight uh, and the ecosystem that we've heard about the faculty graduate students and undergraduates is uh, are uh, important and complex and, and high, a highly interdependent one it's not an exaggeration to say that our recruitment of the best faculty hinges on the quality of our graduate students and faculty want to work with the best students which berkeley has no shortage of uh, and uh, if there's anything that you in the audience want to learn more about, or if you'd like to learn how to, uh, to support graduate students, uh, and, and there's a deep need for that, uh, please be in touch with us. 
Uh, we absolutely want to be part of advancing basic science education and graduate students at Berkeley. Uh, we hope to see you at our next event uh, on inspirations from natural systems on November 10th. And with that, I'll say fiat lux and go bears. <laughs>